Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our midweek service as we are concluding tonight the book of 1 Peter. We are in the fifth chapter. Um, we're pretty much going to go through this whole last portion here. We're going to just break out some of God's truths in this word because there's a lot that Peter has to say as he's concluding his letter to this church here. Now, one thing we need to keep in mind is that Peter was one of the apostles, one of the 12, and Peter had an amazing story. Um, you know, Peter was one of the only disciples that was actually married. Uh, so he had a wife and kids. So it was a bit of a sacrifice for him to, I mean, not only go and follow Jesus, but leave his business and everything behind. But, you know, he's also leaving his wife behind as well. But he understood the call and how important it was for the mission that Christ had called him to. And we know that Peter was very impulsive in a lot of things that he did. We know that he was the kind of guy who would jump before he actually looked uh, but one of the only of the 12 to actually step upon the water and walk when Jesus called him to walk out there. So he was only, not only bold, but he also had a level of faith that allowed him to experience some of the, the power and the beauty of God. He was one of the three that were there when Jesus saw the, you know, came before Moses and Elijah in the transfiguration. Uh, so he was witness to a lot of powerful things. But he also had his flaws, you know, and some of the flaws that Peter had was that uh, because of his boldness, sometimes he would speak before he actually thought. So there was a time where Jesus was telling Peter, hey, listen, uh, there's going to be a time when I'm going to be leaving. And before I do, the Satan is going to come and he's going to try to sift you like wheat. He's coming after you. He's coming after your soul, Peter. And Peter, being the man that he is, he says, no, Jesus, of course not, man. Like, that's definitely not going to happen. I'm going with you all the way to the end. And he says, no, man, be careful. You are going to be sifted like wheat. And it got to the point where, you know, whatever was coming upon him that Jesus had to say to Peter, get behind me, Satan, because Satan was already doing the work in him. And, you know, he was also one that um, not only when that time came, though he said he was going to be there with Jesus when Jesus was actually taken into captivity and was going to be persecuted and, and ultimately give his life. Peter cowered down three times when he was asked if he was one of the disciples. He said, no, nope, and he denied Jesus three times. So he had this raging battle within him of wanting to do the right thing, but then his flesh would kick up, and he faced all kinds of trials. He faced persecution. Uh, ultimately, Jesus, when he returns after being uh, in the grave three days and comes back triumphant and victorious, he restores Peter. And three times he asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And all three times, Peter says, yes, I love you. And he says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, restoring the three times that Peter had denied him. So we see how Jesus restored him to, to give him this, this, this mission of going out and being the foundation of the early church. And Peter was one of the, the big guys, the big dogs, if you want to say, in the church as it began to grow, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, and preaches, and 3,000 come to the church. So Peter's a big deal. Um, and as he's going around preaching the gospel to the Jews, uh, we know that Paul comes into the picture and his mission is to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. But the two of them at one point had a little falling out. Uh, Paul had to correct him because Peter was doing things once again because he doesn't think. He just does what he sees and sometimes reacts. And like, like a lot of us, right, we sometimes do things and then we have to ask for forgiveness later. But there was a time when he was hanging out with some Gentiles and some Jewish believers came in. And all of a sudden he began to change his attitude and, and mistreat the Gentile believers. And that's why Paul had to call him out and say, hey, don't change. We've already discussed that these Gentiles are engrafted in by faith in the, in the fellowship of Christ. So we see that he's gone through so much. Uh, in growing this church, and he begins to write this letter here, and the apostle Peter, as an apostle, has a level of authority as he is speaking to these churches. This letter is written to believers in this area, and it's probably written to a bunch of local pastors or elders, um, encouraging them and telling them all of these things that they may face, and we see that in the beginning of his letter, he's telling them, hey, look, you're going to face some trials, and we understand in this time they were under uh, kind of a hostile government in Rome. It was not the most um, favorable place to be in, for a Christian at least in that sense. And he's encouraging them, hey, look, trials are going to come, but don't worry about it. This is how you get through it. And then those trials became fiery trials that we read on, and he tells them, hey, this is how we get through it. And now we get to this crescendo. We're at the end of this letter in chapter 5. And as a good shepherd, as a good pastor, he's giving these other leaders instructions 
on what they should do. And not only these leaders, but for people who are within the body of Christ too. So this letter kind of goes twofold. So you may think to yourself, well, I'm not a shepherd, so this is not for me. It goes for both. And I want us to kind of listen because if you were to ever write a letter and you're concluding it, you make sure that your most important instructions that you're going to give somebody are there at the end. And I believe that Peter has given us his most important instructions at the end of this letter. So what we're going to do is we're just going to break down this letter, this last portion. I got four points for you guys that I think you guys can all take from this as well that will help you whenever you may face whatever trials, whenever you may face whatever kind of opposition that may come your way. So the first thing I want you to know that we're in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 4 is where we're going to start off right now. But the first point I have for you is that when you're facing something, when you're going through a trial, the first thing we should understand is that we're not meant to be alone, and what we should do is choose your shepherd. And listen to what he says here. I don't know if they have the notes there. They'll get it for you in just a moment. So look at what he says here. He says, so I exhort the elders among you. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, who these elders are. As a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So he's speaking to pastors. He's speaking to elders. He's telling them, hey, I'm I'm a fellow elder like you. But this is, the, this is the command I give you. This is the exhortation. This is the encouragement. This is the instructions I'm giving you. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. And listen to what he says to them. Exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those you're in charge, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, which is Jesus, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. One thing that I see here is the instruction is for leaders, but I told you the title for this first point is choose your shepherd. See, when you as a follower of Christ are looking for a pastor, you should have a pastor who has, number one, the heart of God, who is, number one, sold out for the things of the Lord, who is a fellow elder who has witnessed not only suffering in his own life, but understands what it takes to follow Christ. See, Peter is exhorting these pastors, and this is an encouragement to me because I know that me as your pastor, I have a mandate given to me, and he makes it very clear. But here's the thing, right? As he tells them all of these things, we have to understand, number one, that when you're in a church, it's not a single leader who calls all the shots. You may think my pastor calls all the shots. No, 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 no. If you notice here, he says, I exhort the elders. So it's plural. This is a plural leadership. Though I may be the campus pastor here, I am under authority and there are others who are over me. We have an elder board here. We have a senior pastor. We also have leadership amongst this this team here that's local. So I am not a lone ranger out here dictating whatever you guys should do and how you should do it, right? This is a plural leadership, but we're under one single headship, and that headship is Christ. And that headship is where we get our directions. And we have a senior pastor who is subject to others who are above him. So we take our lead. And here's the thing, right? So we do have Pastor Craig, who is our senior pastor, but he is not leading all by himself. He has campus pastors like myself who come alongside of him. He has other administrators and other people who come alongside of him. So it's this plural leadership. And I want us to think about this because you think about the Trinity. The Trinity is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But who's the head of the Trinity? God the Father. But they're all equal. None of them take a lesser role, but God the Father is the head of the Trinity. Let's think about the family structure. And in your home, husbands and wives, who's the head of the house? Husbands. But does it mean that he lords over his wife? No, they're co-leaders in raising children, in raising and doing what they do in their homes. So there is one who the buck stops with because there has to be someone who at least is kind of leading where, you know, taking us into a certain direction. It's no different than the universal church. Christ is the head of the church. And we are his body taking our lead from him. And the same happens with the local church. You know, me as your campus pastor, I'm not doing this alone. I have other leaders who are with me doing this together. So this is important because as he's telling them this, he's exhorting the elders among you. 
So that's not just the senior pastor, but that's all of you who might be in this church, in this campus, those of you who are in my leadership, you are included in this, okay? You are included in these fellow elders who are now given this exhortation, and me as your pastor who's maybe the head of this campus, but I'm not doing this alone, I'm exhorting you as well. And he says here to shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. But listen to the key thing, not under compulsion. No one's forcing anyone here. So let me tell you something. If anyone in my leadership tells you, I don't feel like doing this, they're just making me do this, please let me know. But they wouldn't say that. But they wouldn't say that because they understand God loves them and they love God and they're doing this because they love God. But this is the thing. We're not doing this under compulsion. I don't do this under compulsion. I know there's a call in my life and God has given me a grace for this. Anyone who looks to be a leader, looks to be an elder, God gives a grace for that. If there is no grace for it, then you are doing something under compulsion. But he said, do it willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain. So we're not trying to get rich. Trust me, look, if I wanted to be rich, I would not be a pastor, y'all, for real. Like I had a pretty good paying job before I took this one here. All right? So I didn't do this for the money. I did this because I know God called me to this. And I'm not domineering over those who I'm in charge of. I would never ask any of you, nor anyone on my team will ever ask you to do something that I myself wouldn't do. And that's what you should look for when you're looking for a church. You guys have already found us. I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir here, but somebody watching on the interwebs or some other church might be wondering, am I in the right place? Am I in a place where I believe God has called me to be? Do I have shepherds that are doing what God has called them to do? This is the example. He says, being examples to your flock. In other words, as I follow Christ, you follow me. If I'm doing something else, please call me out on it and don't follow my example if I'm not living for God, because we understand that there's one single headship, but there's plural leadership. So Peter is an apostolic leader who's giving wise counsel to overseers. He's like a bishop. So if you think about a bishop, not in the sense of the Catholic church, but like in the Bible times, you had one who was an overseer of many other leaders and churches at that time. That's what a bishop is. And that's what the role that Peter served under. But then under that would be elders, and elders will be just like what you think, right? Respect your elders. Someone who's older, someone who's mature in the things of God, someone who understands the word of God and can help properly teach the word of God. Not that they have to be a preacher, but they can teach the word of God. The Bible is very strict on that. And I'm going to kind of share that with you in just a moment here. And then you have shepherds, and these shepherds are relational leaders. These are the ones who are in the trenches with you. These are the ones who you call when you need help. These are the ones you call when you're in the hospital or when you need to be married or when you need someone buried. These are the ones you call in the shepherds. These are the ones who are there with the sheep. Now, the word sheep, I know it can sound very derogatory, but it's not. It's just saying I've attached myself to a shepherd because Jesus is the good shepherd. I'm a sheep as well, right, because I'm following a shepherd who is shepherding me. So sheep is not a bad thing, but finding yourself a good shepherd who's going to protect you because the, word you, the Bible uses that word a lot in ministry and different groups are defined differently. But 1 Timothy, if you guys want to go back on your own time and read it, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13 gives clear instructions on what an elder looks like in the church, what a deacon looks like in the church. If you want to know what that looks like, and maybe you feel like, do I have a call to ministry? Do I have a call to do this as well, to come alongside my pastor, to be a plural leader in this? Well, look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, and see if you can answer those questions well. I would read it, but it's a long portion of Scripture, and I have a lot to unpack tonight. But... As you choose your leader, my first point, the one thing we can all agree is that that leader has some do's and some don'ts, right, that you should be looking for. Now, let's kind of go over some of these things, all right, with me? So if I am your pastor, there's some things you want to see me do, right? And some of those things are is exercise oversight, just like my leaders. You want to see them exercise oversight. We want to serve you willingly because God would have us to do that. And we want to be an example to you as a flock in serving the external chief who will become one day. We're serving Jesus because he's a real person who is going to come and return for his church as our chief shepherd. So I'm entrusted with this flock that he has given me, and I want to shepherd it well. And those of you who are in leadership should do the same. These are things you don't want to see me do. Ready? You don't want to see me serve under compulsion because I wouldn't have the right heart. I couldn't give you anything. I would give you out of the lack, not the abundance you wouldn't want to see me out here swindling and taking money from the church, right? I wouldn't want shameful gain, and I would never domineer over you. The minute you see me doing any of those, call me out. 
Call Pastor Craig and say, hey, your pastor here has lost his mind, right? Because that's exactly what it is. I mean, that's not what a shepherd should do. See, 1 Peter tells us, right, that we're going to go through various trials. And as your shepherd, I need to tell you that you would go through various trials, as he said. But remember, those various trials turn into fiery trials, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, which, lay, which will lead eventually to Peter's second letter where he instructs the church and the people of God on what they need is leaders. And that's what he's going to talk about in the next letter is why we need leaders and why the church is lacking it. We need leaders. We need people to stand up. So when you are reading this letter and you're looking at yourself going through a trial, understand this. You need to choose the right shepherd because that right shepherd is going to give you his life. He's going to lay it down for you whenever you're going through that. That's what God has called them for. That's what God has called them, the plural leadership, to, which leads me to my second point. You need to find a flock. So many people want to do life alone. So many people just say, ah, I'm good being at home watching this ministry on TV, and I'm having church here all by myself. Okay, you can try that. But look at what he says here. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Why does he say be subject? I know that word sometimes you're like, I don't want to be subject to nobody. Can I just tell you that isolation causes desolation? Isolation will cause you desolation in your life. You will be so alone. But there's something beautiful about coming under leadership that has the heart of God. Because that leadership will not only help you, but it will mold you, will direct you into the things of God. It will tap into those giftings that you have in you so that you can begin to walk out what God has called you to do. But when you're out alone and you're trying to read this Bible all by yourself, who's there to exhort you? Who's there to help you? Who's there to encourage you? Who's there to correct you? Nobody. And that's why he says, subject yourselves to the elders. Why the elders? Because they've been through it. They've been through the battles. They've been through the war. And when you find yourself in that war, when you find yourself in that battle, they have strategies that maybe you can't think of or you've never thought of. And that's why it's important. See, we all live in this spectrum. And on one end, we have humility. On the other side, we have pride. And pride is what keeps us away from doing the things that God has called us to do because we think we know it all. And somewhere we live in the middle. We live in that middle there, right? Like pride, pride wants to pull us this way. Humility is this way, right? But we, we need to understand that, right? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking yourself less. Thinking about me less, not thinking less of myself. I know who I am in Christ. I'm a giant in the Lord. But does that mean that I walk around boastfully and say, I know who I am in Christ, I'm Jesus' favorite? No. I think less of myself and I say, I see the giant in you. <laughs> I see who Christ has called you to be. I can talk about walking around here like, I know who I am, I'm God's favorite. Right? My wife and I always go back and forth to that, right? <laughs> in, in a beautiful way, though, because we understand we're both God's favorite. We never do that. We never exercise that because we see that you are too. <laughs> My wife's like, mm, I'm God's favorite. Humility lets God be the center of your life, right? When God is at the center of your life, rather than you being the center of everything. See, when you're in the center and you have to include God, there's no space for others. But when God's at the center and you revolve around him, you know what that does? It leaves space for others to come around and be able to revolve around him. That's what humility does. It's not all about me. Humility lets God be the center of your life, leaves rooms for others. Humility, per, humility permits you to accept help from God and from others. Can I tell you, I struggled with this for a long time. There were times where I would, me and my wife can tell you, we were hurting for certain, and people would come in and say, hey, I want to bless you. And I'm like, no, I don't want that. I'm good. We're fine. Don't worry about it. In the meantime, my mind, like, yeah, I need this help right now. But I'm not going to tell you I need this help because then if I tell you, you're going to know what kind of condition I'm in. And I don't want you to know what kind of condition I'm in because I'm blessed and highly favored. Lying. 
lying. You know those people that come into church. Hey, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored, filled with the Holy Ghost. Jesus loves me. I'm his favorite. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. Right? You know those people? Meanwhile, they're outside. I just got to pump the gas a few times to get this car on. But like, it sounds like you got no gas in there. Man, you know why I ran out of gas, man? You got five dollars I could put on this? I thought you was blessed and highly favored. I thought you was the head and not the tail, the lender and not the borrower. We got to be careful when we speak these words of God. We need to walk in humility. <laughs> because you don't understand that though that person wants to help you and bless you, you are also restricting a blessing from them. Because God may have called them to bless you at this moment. You don't know what God is speaking to them. But by you saying no, you're stopping the blessing that they're trying to release in their lives. But we need to walk in humility. Let's look at some examples. Because Jesus is ultimately the, the model of humility that we should live after, that we should go after. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 11. Listen to how much humility Jesus walks in. Ready? Have this mind among yourself which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, hey, this is yours because Christ has given you this by his spirit. Have this mind among you. And listen to what he's done. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a what? Servant. This is God coming down. And he didn't come on earth to exercise that domineering, I am God, serve me. Instead, he says, I'm going to serve you. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, meaning he took on this earthly suit. Can you imagine how hard that was for God to put on an earth suit? But he did. And he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, remember what Peter just said here? Let's go back and say what, look at what Peter just said. Didn't he say, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. See, there is a blessing that comes when we walk in humility. And Jesus is ultimately that example. He walked in that humility by taking on the form of human, even to obedience to death on the cross. But it says because he did that, God exalted him and gave him the name above every name. That doesn't mean your name is going to be above every name. Of course not. But you know what? Every morning you wake up, them demons tremble because they know who you are. They know who you serve. They know who you live for. Because you are a servant of the Most High. Amen. Look at Mark 10, 45. It says here, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom. Humility. Humility. Putting his own desires and need aside for humanity. Mark chapter 9. And he sat down. This is Jesus. If you go back and read a little bit earlier on chapter 9, you have James and John coming to Jesus and saying, hey, Jesus, man, uh, which one of us is going to sit at your left and your right? Like, mind you, there's 10 other guys that are part of this group, but they're worrying about where, where they're going to be seated at. And they're like, yo, Jesus, where are we going to be seated at when we get to heaven with you? And then Jesus is like, look, man, it's not important about all that. And they're like, no, we want to know. So then he sits them all down, and he sat them down and called the rest of the guys, called the 12, and he said to them, if any of one would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. This is what he has called us to. You're going to have to zoom that out. Too. I didn't realize it got zoomed in that far. I'm watching the camera going crazy <laughs> in front of me. Um, he's servant of all. One more for you, one more, because Jesus is the ultimate example. And I think this is great that you guys understand this because this is who Peter is pointing all of us to. Mark chapter 10, verse 42. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord over them. 
and their great ones exercise authority over them. But then he goes on here. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. So he says it twice to us there. Nearly over 900 times and all throughout scriptures, we see this word of humility, this kind of driving the body of Christ, those who follow God to live a life of humility, not exercising authority, not saying, hey, look at who I am. Do you know who I am? Like, I'm that pastor who needs an armor bearer all on four sides of me, making sure that no one gets close to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not that kind of guy. Neither was Jesus. But when you see that, be careful. Because there's a level of pride that comes in there when people can't approach the man of God as if he has some kind of special anointing that we don't have access to. No. Jesus made himself available to all. And we as ministers, fellow elders in this, should never exclude ourselves from the body of Christ because there are others who need what we have. And when we feel like we've gotten to a place where we can't, God, God help us. So let me show you eight points here that are pride versus humility, things to look for, things to watch out for. Pride is demonic. Humility is godly. Pride pulls up hell. Humility invites heaven down. You're going to have to twist and fine-tune that because that's out of focus. There's like a little knob on the side there that you can... I don't know if there's anybody who knows how to work the cameras on that little arm there. Um, pride is natural. Comes no problem. Put a couple two-year-olds in here and watch them start fighting about who owns what toy and this is mine. It just comes natural. You don't need to be taught pride. But humility is supernatural. It comes from God. The Holy Spirit allows you to walk in humility. Do you have a question? I'm sorry. <laughs> Number two, pride pulls up hell. Humility invites heaven down. And if you miss any of these notes, feel free to come and see me after service. I would love to share them with you. The next one is number three. Pride is natural. Humility is supernatural, meaning it's a gift from God that he gives you to walk in this humility because we have the spirit of God living in us. Jesus was full of the spirit, yet served and was walking in humility. It comes from being filled with the spirit. Number four, pride is like a demon. Humility is the spirit that casts out that demon. See, pride will rise up, isn't it? Satan, when he tempted Jesus, was all about himself, was all about making Jesus bow down and worship him because he wanted to exalt himself. That's what cast him out of hell, I mean, out of heaven, was pride. He thought he can be just like the most high. This created being wanted to be like the creator. And because of that, he fell and took a third of the angels with him. Yeah. Number five, pride is how we war against God, I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, war against God and humility is how we worship God. Pride is how we war against God. This is how we are at odds with him because we think we know it all. We got this. Don't worry about it, Lord. You want to come for the ride? Cool. But if not, I'm, I'm a ghost. But humility is how we worship God. Lord, I'm nothing. I'm broken. Only you have the answers that I need. Only you have what I, I need, and you can only provide it. This world can't give me what I need. Drugs can't give me what I need. Alcohol can't give me what I need. Sex can't give me what I need. Cars can't give me what I need. Houses can't give me what I need. Only God can give me what I need. But what happens is because we're so prideful, we try to fill ourselves with these external things, thinking it's going to take care of that hole in our heart, that hurt in our hearts, and it doesn't. Only God can do it. Number seven, pride. I'm number six. Did I miss number six? I'm sorry. Number six, pride can humiliate you. Only you can humble you. Pride will humiliate you, but you can only humble yourself. Pride can't humble you. 
It can humiliate you, but it will never humble you. Some people say, well, man, they went through some hard times and it really just brought them closer to God. No, it's just that they were embarrassed and they had nowhere else to go. But they were humiliated first, and that's the only, it, it, we, wish, we wish we never get to that point where we're to the point of embarrassment that we now have to come to Christ, but it's the humiliation that brings us back because we knew all along that's what we should have been. But because we thought we knew best, that's what happened. Number seven, you guys can't figure it out. It's a little knob on the, on the handles. There's like a little circle knob that you twist. Oh, you have to lock it. There's another camera there if you want to just switch to that camera. Because I see this moving around, and it's kind of messing with my eyes. <laughs> Pride is a destination. Humility is a direction. What do I mean by that? Pride is a destination where you can unpack your bags and stay. Shut up shop. Live there. But humility is a direction that we must go towards that we never actually get to. Because the only moment we get to humility fully is when we begin, sit before the Father when we come before God, but we always strive in that direction, knowing that there is something better in that direction than just staying in a place of pride. Number eight, pride is the cause of most relational problems. Humility is the cure for most relational problems. I've seen this all the time. No one wants to give in a relationship because they think they know better or their way is the right way. Or you just don't understand what I'm going through. And because of that, it causes problems in a relationship rather than saying, you know what? It's not about me. I'm going to put my cares aside for a moment because I care about you. And it's more important that I honor you and I serve you in a relationship rather than you serving me. When we do that, relationships are much more um, solid. I know in my own relationship, I can, I can relate to that. Because pride can definitely tear us apart. And this is the problem with pride. And that's why Peter is telling these people, be subject to these people. Walk in humility. I get it. It's hard sometimes when correction comes. But understand, they're correcting you because they see what's on the other side there. And they're warning you for it. I tell my kids all the time, hey, don't do this. This is going to happen. And what happens? They don't listen. And what happens is exactly what I told them. You know, but then they start to realize, you know, what, dad be hitting it on the time. He's probably like Nostradamus or something, right? <laughs> no, it's not that I'm Nostradamus, it's that I've been there. And, you know, your parents can understand, right? It's like my, my dad used to always say that, like, been there, done that. There's nothing under the sun that you haven't ever done that I haven't done. Like, all these little slow sayings that he used to do, these little idiotism. And I'm like, man, where does, he, where does he get all these little words? And why does he say all this stuff, right? And I used to think to my dad, like, but you, you're old, like, you don't grow up in my generation, so you don't understand what I'm going through. And now that I'm like that boomer to my kids, and they're probably thinking, you're old. Like, you don't understand what we're going through. I'm like, yeah, but it's just it's the same old thing, just packaged differently, right? Nothing is different. And what we're going through right now, even in our culture, it's not different. I wouldn't say it's a repeat of what they were going through in Rome, but it seems like history has, like, these rhymes, right? I wouldn't say it repeats, but it rhymes. Certain things happen. And then we're seeing these certain things happen, and they almost kind of rhyme. They don't exactly look the same, but they feel the same. And we need to be careful because we can get our hearts so jaded because of it, and we miss God in it. Third point I want to tell you here that I believe that Peter is warning us in this final portion of his letter is watch out for the lion. Watch out for the lion. Point number three. He says here in verse 8, be sober-minded. It goes as sober-minded again. He's repeated this before. Opposite of sober-minded is drunk-minded. Mind is not clear. You're not focused. You're foggy. You're not seeing things the way God wants you to see it. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But look at what Peter says here in verse 9. Resist him. Firm your faith. Know that the same kinds of suffering you're experienced by your brotherhoods throughout the world. So what you're going through is being experienced by others. Don't be surprised. And that's why I told you last week, look, I want to prepare you for when things happen so you're not surprised, but you're prepared. And this is what he's saying. Hey, look, don't be surprised when this stuff happens. Instead, resist the devil, firm up your faith, and know that these same kind of sufferings are being experienced by others. 
so you're not special in that way that, oh, I'm the only one who's feeling this. I'm the only experience. No one understands what I'm going through, Pastor. That's why I'm just going to do what I want to do because no one cares and no one knows. God knows what you're going through. And he's told you what to do. Resist the devil. But what happens is when we're out here alone, isolated, when we think somebody's got an offense towards us, we say, you know what? No one cares. I don't care. I'm just going to do what I want to do because it feels good. And that's exactly who the line goes for. But you see, when you're a sheep in the flock, there's protection within the flock, but there's also protection because you have a shepherd who's watching over you for that line. But the minute you wander off all by your lonesome, you're outside the protection of the pack and the shepherd. And you are now like little Bambi, ready to be eaten up. Well, actually, it was Bambi's mom, not Bambi. But you know what I'm saying? This is what happens. Sheep and shepherd need to keep an eye out for lions. I can't do it alone. The leadership can't do it alone. That's when some of you who were here come alongside and say, Pastor, you know, I've been, I've been doing a Bible study with so-and-so, and I've just kind of noticed that their life is kind of taking a turn here. You know, let's pray for them. Let's encourage them. Let's go up to them and talk to them. The Bible says that we should bring two or three witnesses to come up to someone, right? So we don't do this alone. But you all need to see that because we, I can't see every sheep that's in the crowd, but all of you guys who are together can see some of the sheep that maybe I can't see, and we're here to encourage and bring them in because the devil is out there ready to devour. And a good shepherd would feed his sheep, but the lion eats the sheep. So we need to watch out for lions. That's why he says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Resist him. But what happens is we don't listen to these simple instructions and we allow ourselves to be clouded with judgment and with external things and we're not watchful. And the enemy comes in and there's no resisting. When you're drunk-minded and not sober-minded, there's no resisting because you're not even in the right state of mind. So the enemy comes in and influences you whichever way he wants to. See, when a crisis is looming and people are hurting, the enemy is lurking. Let me say that again. When crisis is looming and people are hurting, the enemy is lurking. He's waiting for that opportunity. He's waiting for you to just say, oh, no one understands what I'm going through. Oh, I'm just all alone and no one cares. Oh, this one's nagging and complaining. Just leave me alone. I just need a little time to myself. Okay, I understand you hurting, but we don't respond to hurt in that way. What we do is we respond to hurt by finding protection in the flock. It's when we isolate ourselves, the enemy comes and devours, which leads me to my fourth point. The chief shepherd is for you and coming for you. Look at how Peter ends this letter. Chapter 5, verse 10 through 14. And after you have suffered a little while, not if, but after, because you will suffer, stuff will happen in your life. Just because you said yes to Jesus doesn't mean that all of a sudden nothing is going to happen to you. You're protected, covered by the blood, because all the apostles suffered. Jesus himself suffered. Even after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself, who will do it? Not me, but he himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then he closes out off, closes off by saying, by Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm. And he ends it by telling them to stand firm. All that he's saying, he said, look, everything that I've told you, everything that I've declared to you, everything that I've exhorted you is from God. It's God's grace. It's his truth. Stand on it. When we stand on God's word, doesn't matter what may come, we are shored up that God will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us. If God be for us, who can be against us? The question is not, will I suffer? You will suffer. But God will give you grace to endure it. Peter had a grace to endure it. He suffered. And ultimately, when he gave his life, he suffered. It wasn't an easy death for Peter. So this is coming from a man who suffered, and he's encouraging you to say, hey, I've been there. Keep up the faith. You will feel overwhelmed. 
but God will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. I don't know how else to put that, but that right there, when I read it, I was so encouraged to know that God will do these things for me while I suffer, when I suffer, and after I come out of the suffering. This is what's waiting for me. See, we look at the pain and suffering here right now, and we don't think about the fact that we have something better waiting for us. We get so caught up on what we're facing here that God's saying, why are you worrying about what's here when I have something better for you? I think when we keep our eyes focused on what's better waiting for us, these things seem temporal, and they don't wear us out so easily. We don't get so anxious. We don't get so depressed. We don't get so uh, overwhelmed with these things because we know that there's something better waiting for us. I mean, you would want to run in fear, but God is saying, I want you to stand firm in the faith. I know it's easy to just say, man, God, you don't understand. You left me out here. I'm hurting. Where are you? Why are you so silent? But he's saying, look, I'm here with you, but I got something better for you. Just continue to stand firm. Continue to move forward. Continue to walk in humility. Don't go the other way. See, when you have anxiety and suffering, God has friends, people to bring into your life. He has grace to give you. He has love for you, and he has peace for you. This is what he offers us. That's why we don't do life alone. That's why Peter says, hey, man, find yourself younger folks and find some elders to come under. Do life with them because there's grace in that, there's peace in that, there's family in that, and it's all for you. But yet so often we do life alone. We endure this pain alone. I can tell you there was a time when I walked around prideful, not wanting to receive blessings. Now it's like if somebody says, Pastor, I just want to bless you. I'm like, go ahead and bless me. You be blessed as well. Thank you very much. Right? Like I've learned to not say no. My wife still struggles with that sometimes. She loves to bless everybody. But when it comes to her receiving a blessing, she don't want to take it. I'll be like, look, I'll take that. I'll take that. She'll be looking for it later. I got you. I'll hold on to it. I put it in my bank account, get some interest on it. You know what I'm saying? But I've gotten to that place where I'm like, I don't want to stop somebody else's blessing because I see how many blessing that I've received by being a blessing to others. God has brought me into this family. He's given me the grace to endure as your pastor, as your shepherd. Those of you who are leaders here with me, please lead the same way. Those of you who are thinking about leaders, look at this letter here. Look at what Paul is telling them. Go back to 1, Peter, I mean, 1 Timothy 3. And look at what an elder and leader looks like. If you feel like this is what God's called you to do, please let me know. Because you know what? This is not a dictatorship. This is plural leadership. We have a war to fight. The enemy is coming with relentlessness. He's just constantly coming. And we need to be ready, girded up in our faith, ready to endure whatever he may bring our way. But we can't do it alone. We need you. And that's why as your pastor, I know that I've been commanded to equip you for the work of the ministry because the work of the ministry needs to be done. But it can't be done by just me alone or those around who are helping me. I know I have a certain amount of capacity. If there's room in my capacity to do other things, then I do them. But the minute my capacity becomes full, 